Hi, I'm Parker Johnson with Trust Components of Washington, and today I'm going to be teaching you a little bit about truss anatomy, starting with the top cord. So most trusses are shaped like a triangle, but they can be shaped like pretty much anything. For a basic truss, we have the top defining member, which we refer to as the top cord. Now remember, this is not to scale, but that would be the uh, two by four piece of wood connected with a plate that represents the uh, roof sheathed area of the truss. And similarly with the bottom, we have our bottom cord. This is where the um, sheetrock will go uh, and you'll see that instead of the wood pieces uh, that are actually holding your roof up. Now, typically we have these members that go between the top and bottom cords called webs. These webs help to reinforce the shape of the truss and uh, they transfer forces between the top and bottom cord so that they are effectively moved from the top of the roof or the bottom cord to the exterior walls or the bearings. Now this is typically how we draw a bearing. Uh, it's referred to as a double plate. Um, that gets into a little bit more of the wall anatomy, but um, typically in the top of the wall, you have two two by four members running in line with the wall, and that supports your truss. And this is how we would see those trusses. So these are two 90 degree rotations of the same picture. Um, now, <clears throat> These wood members are held together, like I said, with the metal plates. Um, and we have that load coming down and going out through the bottom cord, the top cord, the webs, and then down through the bearings. Um, so we have certain ways to refer to um, the connecting points of these webs and cords and the spaces between. So where the webs connect with the bottom cord or the top cord, um, we refer to those as a joint. And then the spaces between those joints we refer to as a panel. So uh, the number of joints in a truss and how long those panels are uh, have a large influence on how well a truss performs. The longer a panel is, the more likely it is to deflect uh, or bend, sag, however you would like to call it, uh, when an, a load is introduced um, and the closer together the joints are, the stiffer that panel is. So in order to ensure good, high quality um, trusses are delivered to job sites, we keep our bottom cord panels 10 feet or less and our top cord panels, which keep in mind our top cord panels are measured horizontally. So it is not the distance along the top cord, but the distance from the outside or from one panel to the other. Excuse me. So it is not the distance from the outside or from one panel to the other along the top cord, but how we would measure that if we took each of those points up and measured across. So those we like to keep under eight feet. Now um, we use eight feet instead of 10 feet in order to address the fact that 
that is at a slope. Um, and what we like to do for high snow load areas, so where your snow load is more than 45 pounds per square feet, um, you'll see a lot of um, these eight foot panel lengths uh, sag over time just because you're getting more load than you usually would. So even if a two by four top cord is um, going to work in that snow load, we will increase the cord size to a two by six, which effectively um, eliminates the chance that you go up to your attic in 20 years and you see a truss that sags between those panel points. That addresses our cords and our webs. We also have uh, a special joint, you could call it, which is the heel. So the heel refers to where the truss sits over the exterior wall. And that's typically um, the end of the truss. So these heels are very important uh, because they are a fixed point that all of the trusses have to line up down. So we see this a lot in remodels or renovations um, where we have an existing building. So if we have our existing building here, and that is the wall with the roof going like that. If we were to extend that building, say 10 feet, somebody wants to add uh, another bathroom off of their living room here, uh, we would have to take the existing framing there and make sure that our heel matches that same height. Our pitch is the same. So the pitch is uh, most commonly referred to as um, how many inches of rise you'll have in 12 inches of run. So if you have uh, a 612 pitch, that means that if I were to move 12 inches in, I'm going six inches up. Um, so that's very important because Again, for remodels, uh, if this existing pitch is a 612, then our, let's say we have a 10 foot span. With the 612 pitch, we would be at 30 inches plus the heel height. So if we were to get that heel height incorrect, then our ridge would not line up with the existing. We would be either too high or too low. And again, if our pitch was incorrect, but our heel was correct, um, our ridge would either be too high or too low. And it's very important that those things mesh together. So for new construction, the pitch has a lot to do with the aesthetics of a building. A steeper pitch is obviously gonna have a taller roof. Uh, so if you want to drive down the road and see these nice high sloping uh, roof lines, it looks very elegant. Um, more practical buildings have a lower pitch, usually 612. Um, it's very effective. You can get great looking roofs with it. I'm not trying to say that any pitch is better than any other. And I didn't explain our overhang, but this is a good opportunity. The end of the truss here that extends past the bearing wall, that's what we'll call our overhang. If we were gonna look at this drawing I've made here, this section in here is our overhang. When the water comes down, it goes into your gutter. And if anything spills over, it doesn't run down the side of your wall. It's gonna fall out here a little bit away from your foundation. What that does is it helps prevent the footing uh, for your foundation from eroding away and 
uh, helps keep settling down.